Wexler. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful, you know, people take the mick out of me for doing this every week, Bob. Do they? And well, I actually, it's refer a to you of... as the wonderful <laughs> Bob Cook. Well, I'll tell you something, Jackie. I will never take you. <laughs> I will never take the mickey out of you for that. And actually, I think it provides some status and continuity and predictability absolutely podcast i um, can't think of any other way of starting the show without okay. saying the wonderful mr bob cook thank and you this very, very much episode 160 oh we've got 160 at last absolutely and what we're going to be looking at this week is seven ways you and your client will know therapy is not working well i'll pick seven as a number but if we can get through five i'll be happy there they're quite, uh, quite, I think, big discussions. So uh, I thought when I did the title, Seven's a bit amb- ambitious. But I think, you know, if we're going to think about, as clinicians, about or have a criteria that we know for therapy stroke counselling is working, we should also have a criteria or at least a clinical thought about how do we know it's not working? And then what we do about it. Uh, I I love this title and this topic because I think it's really interesting. What do we do if it's not working? And how do we know it's not working? Yeah, yeah. So let's start with one then. What you 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 start, Jackie. Come up with something that for me, I would always go to the therapeutic <clears throat> relationship. So it would That's be something around the connection with between the therapist and the clients okay i agree with you so i'm going to have a joint one in that but i want to say something because um yeah i'll start off for me and for you face and the connection and interruptions to contact yeah very very important and i also want to say that different people take different times to actually connect to people in other words if we talk about attachment You've got ambivalent attachment, you've got anxious attachment, you've got over-attachment, you've got different levels of attachment. Absolutely, yeah. That will take, may take time for the client or the therapist to attach to each other. Yeah. So just having one session isn't going to, what's that phrase, bite the biscuit or whatever it is. You need to have quite a few sessions to um, come to that place. Yes, yeah, yeah. And there's something in involved in that about maybe if the client feels that they're not understood or that you're on a different wavelength, you know, those sort of things. Yeah, so if you, if the therapist finds it hard to, um, what's the word I want, attune to the client's frame of reference, Yes. then that might be one signal that... Uh, there's challenges in this therapeutic process in the area of getting a robust relationship for work. Yeah, yeah. Or feel like they're not being seen or heard or or those sort of things. That's all the therapeutic relationship to me, yeah. Yeah. So now you're into, which I think is a very good number one, which we know know when it's not working, is uh, when you have to try very hard. Yes both of you together yeah. with, with connection yeah um so things can work has that happened so, with you pardon has, has that happened with you with a client where you feel like you're having to work really hard at it yeah many many times yeah and me too certainly, <laughs> certainly a red flag that effective therapy may not be working yeah and what, and what do we do about it yeah next question yeah what do we do about it when we think oh things are just not working here i don't actually like this person anyway i'm just making something up i don't like this person anyway they don't like me let's refer on yeah now some therapists may do that or some counselors might do that for whatever reasons and i'm not saying uh you know 
if you come to that place, don't do that. Um, but I think there's a, many different options to... I would definitely have a discussion around it. I don't think that would just refer them straight on. No, you know? I mean, if you want, but I think what needs to happen is a discussion, definitely. But I think either simultaneously before that, I think you need to take it to supervision. Yes, yeah, yeah. Find out what your part in the process is. Ten to one, actually, it usually is that they remind you of the darker side of yourself. Yes, yeah. Quite often. Yeah. And that that's a signal for supervision or therapy. It, it often called, you know, analysing the counter-transference yeah. for the person. So if you're actually not getting on with the person, it's usually to do, in my book anyway, about they remind you of the darker sides of yourself. Uh, and if you find it almost impossible to tune to their frames of reference, there has to be a psychological process, which we're going to call counter-transference here, um, which is, I think we need to look at first before we just dismiss yes. the therapy in some way. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. And we certainly need an adult discussion. Yeah. And again, I think, you know, for some people that might be an uncomfortable conversation to have, but I think it's an important one. For both. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, being honest, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, and I know that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Some people like the way I work, and but I know that I'm not suitable for everybody, and that's okay. Oh, oh. And often that is okay. and. You're right. One option is to have discussions. Two is looking at your own counter transcends. Three is to remember, actually, that out of um, often, which can be challenging times in the beginning of psychotherapy, can come the most growth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Having an yeah. honest, open, authentic conversation yeah. between. Yeah. 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 And then, then what happens? They say, Oh, you just remind me of my father in that judgmental place that you go into. Yeah. Da, 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 all that loss. And for you, of course, goodness knows what can come out of your own counter transference as a therapist. But I think discussions are very vital at this level and not to just give up on the client yeah. or to give up on yourself, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Another, another that's, so that's, that's a really good start. Another, I want to say another one then. In trans I'm going to use transaction analysis language again, and I'm sure everybody listening knows parent, adult, child, so I'm going to just use that as the model to explain what I mean. If when you're working with a client, um, you feel that the their parent ego state, father, mother, granddad, whoever it is, yeah. or their critical parent, you're frightened of. Yes or you get frightened around yeah that's a very good signal that from that position effective psychotherapy is unlikely to happen and yes. that you need to do something yeah which again uh, that would that would be supervision first and foremost well it would be first of all where have the awareness is happening yeah yeah you feel frightened and you aren't able to, to be potent with the client when the client needs to have you actually stronger than their own internal critic. Yeah. Um, once you've got that awareness, you need to take it to supervision. You're probably going to have to do some therapy. Yeah. Because that is, that is one of the fundamentals, I think, of psychotherapy is that we are more potent than the, you know, parental interject or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, parental interject, critical yeah. parent, whatever language we use here. Yeah. Uh, because therapy is not going to happen if you're walking around on eggshells around your client. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one area. I've been there. That's why I'm saying it. Yes. I know. Yeah. And also I've supervised many therapists who often come to me with that. Uh, position of course effective psychotherapy isn't going to happen in that position because you end up with two scared people actually yes yeah yeah which for me is is a you know a, a really important thing that I'm in an okay place when I'm working with clients 
you know, it's really important for me to be mindful of my own mental health and where I am at that time, if that makes sense. Well, Do you know absolutely. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the life happens to us as well. We're not immune to things occurring in our life. So it's really important that we're resilient and robust enough in the therapy room to be taking on that parent. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 one process I want to talk about. Have you got another process before I go to another one? Um, again, it, I suppose it goes back to the contracting or whatever that you know we've got clear goals we know where we're going do you mm. know what I mean if we're kind of willy-nilly wishy-washy backwards and forwards in that to me is a sign that that therapy is not working mm. when you're when the contract's not specific or you yeah. make a contract or yes that's too vague or you're me meandering on yeah and, um that's often a sign that's not much is happening. Yes, yeah. But that you might just be past timing. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which I think some clients of mine do do for quite a while before, do you know what I mean? They're willing to get into the nitty gritty. I think mm. to start off with, there's an awful lot of past timing going on. Mm. Yeah. So that's a very good one. Another process is, um, what advice by it? I want us to talk about psychosis. In other words, where the client may um, have fluid psychosis or actually have trace of psychosis when actually um, uh, they need to be either with a psychiatrist or a doctor or somewhere else. Okay. Um, and and if you can't work through the psychosis, and many people have actually think psychotherapy isn't good anyway or positive for people with psychosis, um, then effective psychotherapy isn't going to work in my book if the person's having a psychotic episode yeah and what i mean by psychotic episodes just to be clear for people um it's psychosis definition of psychosis or a psychotic episode is when the person um, moved away from adult reality yeah so i don't think effective psychotherapy is likely to happen if the person hasn't got contact or hasn't got a um you know hasn't got access to their adult yeah i'm not sure whether i've ever experienced that in the therapy room so do you so if, so if you invited people into regression or work with two chair uh, work quite often a crazy part of themselves might appear I'm not saying you've gone, I'm talking about yeah, that's yeah. Why, that's why I think about it. Yeah. And if that happens, I'm not going to take the crazy part of themselves on because yeah. I don't think psychotherapy will, will actually work very well from that position. Um, I'm going to bring them back to adult and talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you saying you've never experienced somebody who's moved away from reality to a place that it's hard to get them to come back to at all. No, no, I'm not saying that. As you're saying it, I'm thinking, yeah, I can think of at least two clients where it has taken a while to get them back. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. And by, you, know, you have to be very proactive with your parent ego state. That you know from that position um so that's another one another where does one does derealization fit into that well you see where does i've, the, I've had clients that come using all this terminology about you know derealization and depersonalization and all this sort of stuff that i'm not even sure they know what that is but they've heard it if that makes sense i'm so not sure depersonalization, depersonalization um derealization they're all movement they are all defense mechanisms and they're all movements away from the self yeah and i right. see them as a protective mechanism a lot of the time so do i good i'm glad so if somebody yeah. starts using that language i will ask say well what do you mean by that yeah 
which I'm sure assume you've done. Absolutely, yeah. If somebody's just got active di- dissociative identity disorder, or they move away from self to the extent that you're probably talking about, then we do know we do need to start thinking. Can we do active psychotherapy from this position? Yeah. Often needs talking about. Now, if you it, here we are again. I think the experience and the skill of the psychotherapist is really important to talk about, to talk here, because we might have psychotherapists, and I'm one of them, <clears throat> that believes that if we go to where they go to in terms of the levels of dissociation depersonalization or derealization we might get to the fragments of the part of the self where uh healing can most happen yes yeah well no one needs to be done in a contract but i think it's also important to just reflect and think you know if i haven't got the skills as a therapist to go to these places will effective psychotherapy happen yeah yeah now i was trained by Richard Erskine and and other people on on how to work in the processes of dissociation, derealization that we're talking about. Having said all that lot, I still have thought, well, is this effective psychotherapy? Now I think it's important to at least think about because they because some people will argue that all those terminologies, if if they're fixed, fixed depersonalization or fixed derealization or fixed dissociation has elements of psychosis about it. Yeah. Now, there's a difference between fixed and traits. So daydreaming, for example, yeah, yeah. is at the one end of the spectrum, we could say, has traits of dissociation in it. Yes, yeah. But if you work up the continuum where there's there's the dissociation is so high that they lose time, you know, or they find themselves yeah, in places they don't know how they got there and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Then that's a different level, <clears throat> different level I'm talking about altogether. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that with daydreaming because, you, you know, <laughs> again, I see that as a protective mechanism sometimes, yeah, do you know what I mean, yeah, to take sure. ourselves out of a certain situation. And I can think of at least one client that saw that as a, you know, a, quite a big problem, but they now know that when they're getting overwhelmed, that's, that's what, what where they, they go to. Do yeah. you know what I mean? That's yeah. what they do. And it's a bit of a warning sign now. Oh, God, I'm daydreaming a lot. What am I avoiding or what's going on in my life? Yeah. So that sounds like that person's got strong enough adult to come back to. Yeah. However, if they were up the other end of the continuum, where we're into more personality disorders, um, and they get stuck in the so-called daydreaming phase and aren't able to get back. Yeah. I'm not sure effective psychotherapy can happen from that place. Yes, yeah. And again, as I'm saying this, it's it's kind of like if they're in the session and they're talking about their experience of daydreaming or depersonalization, all this sort of stuff, at that moment they are in enough adult capacity because they're talking about it as in it's happened and it's the past tense. They're not actually in that place in the therapy room. Yeah, if they're if they're talking about third tense like that, yeah, then it, they tend to be in TA terms, perhaps in their adult ego state. Yeah. Um, now the question would be if you want to take TA to an nth degree, which adult ego state are we talking about? But we'll just stay simple for a moment. So there's continuums to see of all these traits. Yeah. And if we get right up the top end where everything's so fixed, we could talk about that being in the psychosis arena. Yes. Then we need to question: Is psychotherapy going to be effective? Absolutely, yeah. Or at least the type of psychotherapy we do. Yeah. I have another. Oh, I realise I have a few more areas I could go into, but um, I don't want to leave you out of this. Go for it, Bob. Go for it. What about then the whole area of erotic transference? Yes. Yeah. So. You know, where where clients 
talks about being infatuated or sexually attracted to the therapist or vice versa. Yep, yeah, we're not yeah, immune. No, <laughs> no, no, I mean, not at all. Yeah. Um, does psychotherapy happen from that place? No, not That's a sex question. psychotherapy. Yeah, no, I don't think so. So the therapist has a duty to take the supervision. Yeah. That's where I would start. I think the therapist needs to take the supervision and talk about it, especially if the transference is onto the client, and also to talk about uh, if the, you know the process where the um, client is in erotic transference with the therapist. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, psychotherapy, effective psychotherapy, can happen if it's talked about and worked through. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, it won't happen if both parties just either ignore it or the process or i mean that's one of the worst things that could happen if the therapist just ignores the process yeah i'd see that as not being ethical but again i think you touched on it earlier on that the first thing is the awareness of what's actually going on we we've yeah. got to we've got to yeah. have our eye on the ball and be aware that there is something amiss here yeah if they can't work through it i'm talking about the therapist here uh, and there's, there's, they can't work through the sexual attraction or or whatever it's about. And they do need to, you know, not only, they may have to refer on in the end. Yeah. And if the client is so obsessed and sexually attracted and all that sort of stuff, and the therapist isn't enabled to see what it's all about, then that whole thing, that whole person needs to be talked about. Yeah. Because from a place of sexual um fixations and obsessions not much is going to happen no 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 because no, it's kind of like a big fat elephant in the room isn't it <laughs> it's 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 there oh. overriding everything yeah oh. and you know you, you've you've touched on it a couple of times in this podcast about referring on and for me there's no there's no shame in referring on no, not on, even not taking clients on in the first place and knowing your own limitations as, as a therapist. And that leads to another area, of course, of transference. If the transference from the therapist to the client is so fixed, in other words, not just a lot of transfers, but maybe they look like their father or whatever it is, and yeah, can't work through it, then therapy is, is unlikely to happen, yeah. But you are right. Therapists particularly have a duty of care to be aware. It's a different one. It's to be aware, but actually to clinically reflect, I think, on what's happening for them. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, in, in all honesty, different clients impact me in different ways. They all touch me in one way or another, some more than others, if that makes sense. No, it makes absolutely but sense. But I'm 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 aware of the relationships with each and every one of my clients. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another area, just where the time of the podcast. Another area you've got. Yeah. Um I I was thinking about fundamental differences of opinions. <laughs> well, usually a parental competition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I Two know I've had clients in the past that have had really fixed views on certain things that I don't agree with. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and if you're, if you or you, if both parties are so fixed that they can't work through that, then probably you aren't the right therapist for them. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Absolutely. Usually, though, I think if you can get beneath the content, you'll find out what the process is. Yeah. And again, it, it's it's a really good place for therapeutic change as well, looking at differences between us and how we can work through that as far as communication and, and things like that is concerned. Mm. Mm, absolutely. I mean, you know, 
political yarn of a certain ilk on fairly left wing, I think, probably quite socialist. And you know, I've I've had many clients very right wing, sort of very sort of Trump's quite, let's take Trump, he's very right wing or yeah. Trump Trumpites, or I could think of other figures, by the way. Um, I don't want to just stereotype, but but the, but the person been at the other end of the political spectrum so so dramatically it's impacted on me and i've had to take it to supervision and the best way is to see what's underneath the content yeah uh, so look at how it affects how that personalized personalization has affected you impacted you so much yeah yeah because we, we we're not gonna be everybody's cup of tea you know our beliefs and values are it's part of who i am you know so yeah even though i don't think that should come into the therapy room it it invariably can do at times yeah and one of my real philosophies i'd like to work on is however bizarre things are in the present or you know here we talk about political spec spectrums or references if you trace it back then it all makes sense yes yeah yeah and it, you know for me you know as a final note or whatever there's there's something about clients sometimes feel worse before they feel better mm. and might take that as therapy is not working or this isn't good or whatever it is you know i've had that conversation quite recently with a client where we we have had to speak about you know this isn't a linear process no, it, no. you know and sometimes we do feel like we've taken a backward step, but the reality is we're still moving in the right direction. That's right. I couldn't agree more. And I think the key to this podcast, really, for therapists, counsellors, is that if you think the, for all the different reasons we talk about, and many more, I suspect, that, you, that you've got yourselves, the first place is supervision. Yeah. So, because it's what we do about it. When we come to the conclusion, effective therapy isn't happening because of X, 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 X. Yeah. What we do about it is the next question. Yeah. And from, I think what we do is we take all this to supervision. Yeah. Do you ever openly say to clients that you feel like it's not working? Uh, if I do, and I have, I'll say something more well, like, you know, I've been thinking about what we talked about last week and where we're at. And in fact, it impacted me so much of talking to my own supervision because I, I was wondering actually if we were, if the therapy is working for either of us for all these different reasons. And what came out of supervision was this. What What's your thinking on this? Yeah. I say, yeah. I don't just say, look, in that one. It's second, not working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot more to it. Yeah, because... but I think that's an important part of it as well to to have a, a, a you know a discussion about yeah what's going on yeah you, and usually another sort of part of this besides me saying what I've just said about yeah. this, is the developmental part of this. In other words, yeah. I'll say yeah I you know I was thinking about what's happening between us and I was I was wondering. What's been re reenacted for both of us in this? Yeah. This relationship we're in. What we actually could be re reenacting from our past, which is getting played out here. Yeah. So I, which can I, be a really valuable tool to use. Hmm. Yeah. Because something obviously has been reenacted out. So, yeah. as I'm a developmental psychotherapist, I always think that whatever happens between me and clients is a reenaction of the past. Yeah. Or has some part and reenaction yeah so i always, always will invite that discussion and in fact you know now i'm thinking about in this podcast that is probably the most valuable tool 
when I've got stuck and I think therapy is not working, is when I am when I've obtained a supervision, is to talk with the client what, about what possibly could be reenacted here that we're both yeah. missing. Yeah. Because Take it is my part as well as the other. Yeah, absolutely. But if it is a reenactment, then doing it a different way can be very therapeutic. Absolutely. And, and that's the changing the outcome. Yeah. Yeah, that's the empowering of the developmental inquiry. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a it's an opportunity and an opening for lots of change if we think that therapy is not working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we need to look at what's being enacted out. Absolutely. Yeah. We usually take it to supervision first, and usually out of the supervisionary discussion, um, we, I can reflect on my what possibly could be enacted out from my position, and then we can talk about it in therapy with the yeah. client. And from that place, um, there's usually a real opening in therapy. Yeah. That was really useful, Bob. Thank you. You're welcome. We've finished the 160th one. So now on to another 161st and 162nd. And what are we doing? I'm just having a look at what we're doing. Next week. Um, I don't even know what we're going to do. Separation, individuation in the therapy process. Okay, that's one of them. Great title. Um, the effects of divorce within therapy. Now, let's, what else have you got down there? Skip that one. Let me have a look at what else we've got. I've I've got a long list here of yours, Bob. What? Um, Let's just start off. Let's do next week separation and individuation in the psychotherapy process, and we can work out what we're going to do later down the road. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I dog. like that title, separation, individuation, and psychotherapy, because you know a lot a lot of what clients have to do is about self-agency empowerment and strengthening their sense of self and if they're still in a symbiotic relationship it becomes very hard to do that yeah and it's a process that we all go through in one form or another as human beings yeah, yeah. of course i mean that's part of the podcast but yeah, absolutely so okay, I won't but... get into it now, but it's no, like... no, save the juicy stuff for next week. So <laughs> until then, thank you so much. Yeah, look, see you next week. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.